Welcome to On Strike, a production of Worker Strike Back. I'm Shama Sawant. My co-hosts Kaylin Nicholson and Emily MacArthur will be back next week. All eyes here in the United States are on the American presidential election. Last week on this broadcast, On Strike was joined by Sabrina Salwadi of Savvy Sab's podcast and the Revolutionary Blackout Network to talk about Kamala Harris and Donald Trump and why working people can't put our faith in either and need to build a new independent working class party. 50 countries are hosting major elections in 2024. Britain, France and Taiwan and India are among the countries that have already had theirs. And there's a lot for us to analyze in terms of the huge anger of working people at the political establishment and how that is playing out internationally with some countries seeing gains for the far right in the absence of a fighting left alternative. Today, we have a special guest from London with us, James Kerr, to talk about the recent elections in Britain from a working class perspective. James is an English teacher, the Lewisham branch secretary of the British NEU or the National Education Union, and a member of the NEU National Executive. James is also a socialist. The European Parliament held its election in June, where the principal feature was anger against all the mainstream corporate parties that have for years betrayed the interests of working people and struggling small farmers. The far right, such as the European People's Party, a Christian nationalist group, and Patriots for Europe, founded by far-right Hungarian President Viktor Orban, made major gains. In all, over a quarter of MEPs, or members of the European Parliament, now sit with hard and far-right groups, mostly on the basis of advocating racist and nationalistic ideas to the difficult economic conditions and cost of living crisis facing millions of ordinary people. Coming on the heels of the European Parliament elections, the elections in France were expected to see a potential victory for Marine Le Pen's far-right National Rally Party as well. But that is not what happened. Emmanuel Macron, the incumbent president and his ruling Renaissance Party, lost after savage attacks by him last year on the pensions of French workers with legislation raising the retirement age from 62 to 64. But Le Pen's far-right party did not win as they were expected to either. It was actually a regroupment of left and center-left forces called the New Popular Front that came out ahead in the election. This points in a different direction than some on the left internationally have been arguing that working people are unidirectionally moving to the right. And in the UK elections, we saw the Tories, the Conservative Party, lose humiliatingly but expectedly after 14 years in power. This has put the British Labour Party now at the helm. However, it is far less of a vote of confidence in the Labour Party and its leader, Keir Starmer. It was far more a vote against the Tories, a throw-the-bums-out anti-incumbency mood. In fact, this was the lowest turnout election in Britain in more than a century. As a report by the Institute for Public Policy Research noted, quote, if the non-voters were a party, they would have won by a landslide, end quote. We also saw a landslide election of Jeremy Corbyn as an independent left candidate after Starmer's wing of the Labour Party undemocratically blocked him from running as a Labour candidate. Corbyn's position against the Israeli state's genocidal war on Gaza undoubtedly played a role in his decisive win. If some of this sounds familiar to you here on the other side of the Atlantic, you're not wrong. Biden has been swapped out for Kamala Harris, but she is in every way a continuation of the Democrats' warmongering anti-worker agenda. Right-wing billionaire Donald Trump is certainly no alternative for working people either. This is exactly why On Strike is so important. You simply won't hear the analysis we present here on any mainstream media. So please subscribe to our channel. Become a member of Worker Strike Back to help ensure we can continue to build our movement against the bosses and their political servants, and so that On Strike can continue to bring the kind of discussions about strategy needed to fight back and win. We don't run any ads, we don't accept corporate money, and we rely entirely on donations from working people. Don't forget to go to workerstrikeback.org and register for our rally at the protests at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago on August 20th at 6 p.m. Chicago time. You can register to be there in person with us in Chicago or watch on the live stream. Either way, it's really important you are there.
We will be joined at our rally by Jill Stein, who is running for president as the strongest left independent anti-war pro-worker candidate. If you support building the biggest possible protests at the DNC and want to help build our movement against the bosses and their political servants, please donate now. Go to workerstrikeback.org and click on Donate. Welcome to On Strike, James. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for being here with us. Can you talk about the UK election results, about the defeat of the Tories, the character of the Labour Party, which is now in power, and what this means for working people? I mean, as you kind of touched on in your introduction, this was a general election with very little enthusiasm from working class people in particular, um, very low turnout also very low-key campaigns. It was almost hard to um, tell that there was a significant political event going on uh, in communities. You know, the absence of, you know, posters, of mass canvases that we have seen in previous general elections. And there was a sense of inevitability that um, the Tories, after 14 years of austerity, of um, corruption, particularly uh, blatant during the COVID-19 pandemic um, and their um, continuation of the so-called culture wars, which uh, were aimed at attacking minority groups and, uh, and, and doubling down uh, on special oppression. All of those things uh, gave a sense of inevitability that Tories would go, but there was also no great appetite for a Starmer-led Labour Party. You know, Keir Starmer has devoted his leadership of the Labour Party um, to rooting out the left, particularly Jeremy Corbyn, um, but also targeting the likes of Diane Abbott, who um, was the first black uh, female MP in Britain. And really right up until the eve of the selection was um, in doubt whether she would be allowed to stand. Um, she was suspended from the Labour Party, whether she would be allowed to stand as a candidate. And all of that was designed um, uh, to to send a signal to big business that the Labour Party was a safe pair of hands, that they had uh, rooted out the left, that they had um, you know brought a kind of stability, and that they could be a trusted servant of capitalism when coming uh, to power. And if you couple that with the position that they've taken uh, on um, on Gaza, then um, there was you know a real sense that while kicking out the Tories was was something that, that was necessary. Um, a Labour victory was not going to be um, the kind of, you know, exciting new dawn um, that so many uh, people expected. That's all very useful to hear, especially at this moment in the US. As you know, Biden is out, as I was saying earlier, and uh, Kamala Harris is now the anointed candidate and anointed is the correct word here because in just a couple of days she has secured enough delegates to uh, be the nominee, official nominee. She raised $200 million, I believe, in the first two days, which is just, I think it has broken all kinds of records. But again, here again, we see exactly what you're saying about the Labour Party in Britain, which is that the Democratic Party, by putting uh, Kamala Harris forward, is really making sure that the billionaire class, the ruling elite of this uh, country, also are very clear that the Democratic Party is uh, going to represent their agenda. and. The whole process that we saw this whole year where the Democratic Party practically put uh, a real clamp down on any kind of primary process is exactly for the same reason. You know, they wanted to make sure that they kept out any kind of working class agenda. And uh, what we've been saying here is what, what's needed is a real working class agenda. And that, that brings me to Jeremy Corbyn. He was, of course, effectively booted out by Keir Starmer's Labour Party. But he stood for election as an independent. He won in a landslide. So I was wondering if you could talk about some of the program that he ran on. And also now, notably, Jeremy Corbyn has announced that he's going to organize people's forums, monthly people's forums, as a way to hold him and the people around him accountable. And he's also, more notably, talked about how this can be a stepping stone for a new party for working people. Can you talk about all of this and also what, in your view as a socialist, would really be needed to build this kind of working class party in the UK? Yeah, so Corbyn's victory, obviously his consistent opposition to the war in Gaza was an important distinction from um, his opponent. 
but it was particularly the National Health Service and the cuts to the National Health Service and the privatisation of the National Health Service that was the issue that he organised around um, and built his campaign around. I mean, the Labour, the the official Labour Party candidate in Islington North, the constituency he was running in, was from a private healthcare background. You know, he was a businessman, and so the kind of class distinction couldn't have been clearer for voters in um, in Islington. Um, on that question of the health service and Corbyn organised rallies. Uh, a lot of his material dealt with the crisis, um, you know, the, the very deliberate crisis that has been created in the health service by the Conservatives. Um, and that clearly had a big impact on his vote. But of course, he also, um, you know, is known for being, for a period of time, the late leader of the Labour Party. Um, and particularly the programme that he put forward in the 2017 election, 2019 election, um, that started to sketch out a kind of reformist socialist programme. That that was also a feature of the name recognition that he has within that constituency. And he's also a very long-standing campaigning MP, um, you know, who is well known in the area. Now, since his election, obviously, he's um, commented uh, in the media on that victory and the impact of that victory. Um, he's raised this idea of people's forums, as you said, which you know clearly has potential, has potential to, to open up you know, democratic spaces for workers, for community, uh, activists, tenants and residents associations and so on to intervene. I think the key question will be, you know, who and how are those forums going to be built? What kind of political direction are they going to be given? Because there's a danger with those kind of, um, you know, democratic exercises that that they just become, um, you know, really something that that puts off the inevitable, the inevitable of, you know, the need to build an organisation around a particular programme. And, you know, there is also a danger that, that, you know, leaders can kind of abdicate responsibility and pass it back to, you know, to a forum that, that you know, unless that's sustained, unless that's uh, built, unless that is given um, some life and some direction can easily, um, easily become, um, you know, something that is, you know, kind of whittled down and runs out of steam over, uh, over time. And I think, you know, what we really feel at the moment in Britain is, you know, while there have been, you know, enormously positive steps forward in terms of a kind of breaking up of the two-party system um, in in Britain, we had the election of uh, four Green MPs. We had the election um, of a number of independent MPs, particularly um, MPs um, who have taken up the issue um, of Gaza um, and where you know where where communities have seen it as an opportunity to to register a vote in protest against the Labour Party's position. But the other big talking point of the election was the rise of Reform UK, led by Nigel Farage, who is a well-known right-wing populist figure, somebody who spends a lot of time in the US at the invitation of Trump and Steve Bannon and so on. You know, the the kind of incoherent anger that exists in a number of areas where it wasn't given the option of a, you know, clear and viable um, and you know potentially successful left uh, alternative it found expression in big votes for F- reform uk who won four seats but most significantly um you know came second in a significant number of constituencies um with you know a massive overall vote and that really points you know a warning sign to the labor movement to the working class that unless we get organized quickly then the, you know that vacuum will be filled by the far right And at the weekend, we had, you know, another, um, you know, mass demonstration led by um, a figure called Tommy Robinson, who is a kind of well-known former or, you know, current football hooligan, but also, um, you know, leader of kind of far-right street movements. And he has sought to, um, you know, attempt to organise on the street. And, you know, that coupled with, a you know, a rise in the, you know, so-called um respectable wing of the kind of right wing populist uh, element in the you know in the in in the shape of reform does you know spell real dangers um that that you know they can become the perceived opposition in the eyes of um you know the kind of disenfranchised 
um, and even you know sections of you know working class people as well. Yeah, I think it's important you mentioned Nigel Farage, who I believe uh, he ran for election eight times and he finally won. Is that isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. So he's he's been a you know he's held um, an MEP seat in the European Parliament in the past, um, but he has always been a figure you know who has. Um, you know, been a kind of also ran, you know, he's he stood in a number of elections, he's been given, um, a, you know, a massive profile, and, you know, a very, very big platform in the UK media. But this is the first time he's been able to make a breakthrough um, in the parliamentary elections. And again, you know, that is because, you know, he has, you know, they very deliberately chose him to be the leader of Reform UK, um, because he brought, you know, he brought a kind of, you uh, a charisma, um, a kind of energy to a campaign. He seemed like somebody who was willing to, um, you know, to take on the so-called establishment. I mean, the reality is he is a millionaire banker, a uh, former banker himself. Uh, he's somebody who will, you know, do the bidding of the bosses uh, and the capitalist class in so many ways. But he is also somebody who understands, you know, how to tap into anger um, of how to orient himself towards, um, you know, sections of uh, sections of voters who are just frustrated and fed up uh, with a lack of alternative. And of course, he is also the person probably most associated um, politically with the, um, you know, the Brexit project um, as well. Yeah, I think a lot of what you're saying about Nigel Farage actually is sounding so familiar to people who. Uh, know about Donald Trump, you know, this billionaire, showman, con man who has occupied this vacuum and, and the right populism that he has built around him, the Trumpism, uh, has occupied this vacuum that is left by the absence of left leadership. And I think the way you're describing the process of the development of consciousness of working class people in Britain, I think it's very educational for what's happening in the United States as well, because the first step obviously is the genuine anger of tens of millions of Americans, just like millions in Britain, against the parties that have betrayed them, parties that represent the interests of the capitalist class, and that working people are really hungry for an alternative. But that hunger is not enough, because then when you don't have an actual militant fighting left that genuinely provides a strategy, an avenue for working class people to get involved in and also to win victories. First of all, defending successfully against the attacks on the gains that they have already won in the past, like the National Health Service, and then going on beyond that to win uh, so progressive reforms that will improve their lives. For all of this, we need the kind of leadership that's actually missing. And I think uh, this also relates to what has happened in Britain in the last couple of years. You know, in 2022, a group of labor leaders, including Mick Lynch, who's the leader of the UK's National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers, or RMT Union, launched what was called the Enough is Enough campaign, which took up fighting working class demands. And that's really, really important. And they instantly got phenomenal support from working people who signed up so rapidly on their website that it crashed. It sort of points towards what can be extremely attractive to millions of working people, actually. But then explain what happened to Enough is Enough after that. What did the union leadership actually do to build around this? And explain how that connects to the potential for an organization like Workers Strike Back that we have launched because the labor leadership here hasn't launched anything like Enough is Enough, but explain why just launching something like Enough is Enough is not em uh, enough, uh, Enough is Enough is not enough, something more is needed. Uh, talk about that and also, James, talk more about how, uh, you know, you've been a longstanding uh, rank and file union member and also a leader in your own union, the NEU, the National Educators Union, which is a very important union, and I, and I believe the largest uh, public education union in Europe. What is the role of labor leaders here, and what is it that you think, as socialists, we need to do in the labor movement? I mean, I'll start with some of the immediate news that's come out in Britain today. 
that is very significant um, because the Labour Party, just as, as Parliament prepares to go on recess for the summer, have been announcing the results of the kind of um, pay review bodies who will um, recommend pay awards for public sector workers uh, in Britain. So, for example, my union, which represents um, teachers and also education support staff, um, as a teacher, you know, my pay award, um, the recommendation is for 5.5%. I mean, this is our first above inflation pay rise since 2006. So it's, you know, it's indicative of a huge um, running down um, and, um, you know, denigration of public sector ways, wages, not just during the um, 14 years of the Tory government, but also during the last Labour governments uh, as well. But if you compare that to what the junior doctors um, were awarded, they've been awarded a pay award, and we still need to look at some of the detail um, of, of these awards, which is always significant. But their pay award uh, is over 22% over the next two years. And the significant difference between um, my union and the unions representing the junior doctors was that they were still in dispute with the government over pay and actually taking strike action in the run-up to the general election um, and and using that to set the agenda in uh, lots of ways. And Rachel Reeves, the the new chancellor in Britain, has you know has has, has been more candid in the media this week uh, in saying that you know strikes have an impact. They have an economic impact, obviously a political impact on an incoming Labour government who are desperate to be seen as a kind of hand of stability. And so they are willing to try and head off uh, industrial action by um, putting their hand in their pockets. But of course, uh, you know, the amount of money being put into pay packets is very much dependent on a willingness to take action. And it's, you know, a very simple, but very important lesson for workers uh, in Britain um, because we, you know, the election comes, you know, really as, you know, a significant strike wave. Um, that has, you know, kind of been reflected in lots of ways in the US as well. But a significant strike wave in Britain um, that brought in particularly workers in education, in the health sector, but also saw, you know, newer groups of workers, workers who maybe hadn't been organised uh, in the past. So, for example, Amazon workers uh, in Coventry um, have taken uh, action, official and unofficial, uh, in order to, um, you know, to try and win uh, better pay and conditions and to win a union there, a uh, recognised union in Coventry, unfortunately, uh, falling just short. But that strike that strike wave is in many ways a, a kind of a symptom really of a rebuilding of the labour movement after a long and um, you know very difficult period um, for the trade union movement. There is the re-emergence, and we shouldn't overstate this, but the re-emergence of um, you know, a, a, a willingness to take to take action of um, the, you know, of, of more groups of workers seeing the necessity of being organised, seeing the results of being organised uh, as well. And, you know, as we've seen in, you know, many other periods, you know, of history, the kind of political and the industrial planes kind of interact with each other that, you know, in, in periods of, um, you know, high... Uh, industrial activity you know workers will get organized um, and sometimes when they're checked on the industrial plane will shift uh, to the political plane and so you know we saw the you know the emergence of the movement around Corbyn as a significant part of that and the defeat of Corbyn you know led to you know a, a kind of new generation particularly of younger people younger workers you know beginning to draw conclusions uh, that the labour movement was something that they they needed to turn their attention to, um, and you know devote their energy, you know devote some energy to, because it was you know the only way that um, you know that, that, that they were going to to see any sort of um, improvement in their situation. Now you know the critical question of you know how you you know kind of marry together the industrial and the political is something that is you, you know that is an age old issue. Uh, in British politics and you know many you know good socialists have commented on the British labour movement as being this kind of very slow and ponderous 
uh, beast really in comparison to other um, to other movements uh, to other countries uh, internationally. You know, you can see explosive events in the US. Uh, you know, explosive waves uh, in other parts uh, of, of Europe. In Britain, things do tend to move more slowly but more decisively. And enough is enough. Did you know? It, it showed a little glimpse of the potential of a movement that could, um, you know, put the trade union movement at the centre um, of a political project. But the reality is, it was never really taken seriously. You know, the people who led that movement uh, from the top saw it as something uh, that was short-lived, that had some short-term gains. It didn't really sink roots into communities, into workplaces. Um, and so, you know, enough is enough doesn't really exist in, in you know, in any real sense anymore. It has no life or no activity. Um, but it was an important experiment for us to see, actually, that there was a huge appetite uh, for that kind of organisation. You know, and the question now um, of where next is something that is being debated in many unions. In my union, we've seen the emergence. Uh, of a new organisation that originally came out of our pay campaign called Educators Say No, which kind of organised around a you know movement to try and reject the below inflation pay offer that we were being given, and our leadership was trying to um, you know push for our members uh, to accept. And it also kind of echoes similar things happening within some of the national health service unions. Um, where we've you know had an organised similar organisation called NHS Workers uh, Say No, which sought to organise across the different unions operating within the health service um, and provide that space. Now, you know, all of these organisations will have their ebbs and their flows, and obviously they have their limitations as well. The critical, uh, you know, the critical thing now is is you know as this movement, um, as you know, the industrial movement has ebbed slightly is is, you know, a really serious, you know, grappling with, um, you know, an understanding of, you know, of what is happening, um, of, of, you know, clear analysis um, and democratic debate and discussion about the, uh, the way forward, because it's, you know, it's very clear the Labour Party, you know, while they will be seeking at the moment to try and head off conflict, of, to try and uh, smooth certain areas over, they are also coupling that with renewed attacks and you know it's, it's inevitable that the you know the pressure of the situation you know the pressure from big business and the bosses will will will, will push them into conflict uh, again with the working class and i think you know the, the the key question for us um you know within the rank and file of of trade unions is are we are we prepared are we able to intervene at the moment you know the, the rank and file in most unions um, is not strong enough to withstand pressure from the bureaucracy and obviously the bureaucracy themselves, the bureaucracies within unions feel pressure from the capitalist class and the bosses in order to you know pass that on. But this is all a process, a process of learning and you know organizations like Workers Strike Back, um, you know, but also you know in, in, in Britain we've seen organizations you know developing recently, um, the organization organized now, uh, strike map um, organizations that are seeking to bring workers together to raise consciousness get people debating discussion discussing uh, and reading all of these things are kind of laying the ground for the potential for you know what we need which is you know kind of movements of reps and shop stewards working um, you know across industries across unions collaborating networking um, and starting to lay that, you know, lay the basis of, you know, a real current, you know, kind of militant current within the trade union movement that can, um, you know, not only just win leadership positions, but actually start to kind of make the weather within the trade unions. So within my trade union, you know, we have unprecedented numbers of um, local strikes at the moment in schools and colleges around the country, workers getting organised, workers balloting taking industrial action you know we've never seen these numbers before and it's because people have come out of the pay dispute from last year come out of that strike wave and have drawn those conclusions that if they're going to see things happen see things change in their workplace they need to be organized and they need to use their industrial power and their might um, to be able to change things that you know the days of political lobbying of strongly worded letters 
you know that you know you know people have seen through that have seen the limitations of that um obviously that's that's only you know a certain step forward um and that now needs to be you know kind of fleshed out into a you know a kind of wider national strategy um and then given organizational form but you know that's that is a significant shift within the the landscape of um the british trade union movement that's all really, really um, useful and fascinating. I think very educational for many of our viewers uh, who obviously may not know the details of what's happening in the UK. And so it's really important to get a real sense concretely of what's happening in the shift in the thinking of the rank and file in the union movement in Britain. And I think you're totally right about um, emphasizing the need for this cross union collaboration, you know, going on joint strike actions and understanding that, as you said, the strongly worded letters don't go anywhere, really need to shut down the profit machine of the bosses. All of this is extremely useful. I wanted to connect it to another, what I think is, I would say, a backbone of what needs to change in the U.S. labor movement. And I wonder what your thoughts are uh, on a similar point in the U.K., which is the deep, deep ties of the leadership of the labor movement in the U.S. to the Democratic Party, which is one of the principal aspects of the logjam in building a militant labor movement in the U.S., which is that, you know, you have a sprawling rank and file, I would say, of the union movement, which obviously is a small proportion of the overall workforce, which is not unionized, most of which is not unionized. But most of the rank and file of the union movement really very open to left politics, to a fighting strategy, which by which I mean everything that you were talking about, including a militant strike action. However, at every step of the way, and it's not just in the presidential elections, it's also in the local and state elections, you have the labor leadership saying, okay, now let's not embarrass the Democrats who are in power, who are incumbents, or whom we are trying to get elected. Let's, let's funnel millions and millions of dollars which are coming from the meager pay of the working class people who are the members of the union movement. And then these union members who uh, repeatedly year after year shell out money and also can go door to door campaigning for the Democrats get betrayed. It's happened over and over again. And we feel the workers strike back and I as a socialist, we feel that that is a major obstacle to moving forward and that we need the labor movement to uh, to fight for a new party for working people. Is there a similar situation in the UK that you can talk about where, or rather, how does the Labour leadership there orient towards the Labour Party, which is obviously a Labour Party in name only at this point? Yeah, so the relationship between the trade unions and the Labour Party goes right back to the foundation of that organisation. Um, and socialists over, that, you know, over, the, over the years have analysed uh, that relationship and, you know, many Marxists have, you know, pointed at times to the kind of growing together and the close relationship between elements of the state and the tops of the labour movement, you know, and, you know, I'll give a couple of examples. We had Brendan Barber, um, who was um, the leader of the Trade Union Congress uh, in Britain, somebody who, um, you know, nominally led the biggest single industrial action um, against the British government since the 1926 general strike in 2011. Uh, Brendan Barber was you know, a big part of selling out that dispute. Um, and he's now Sir Brendan Barber. Uh, you know, he's got a knighthood. He's got a uh, very kind of cushy position uh, within the British establishment. And that's not, you know, that is not an accident. You know, the pressure that is uh, exerted onto trade union bureaucrats, um, particularly bureaucrats who become more and more distant and isolated from the workers that they represent, you know, that really takes its toll. And the Labour Party understands that and the Labour Party works hard, um, you know, in backroom deals, but also in the press uh, and through, you know, many different organisations to try uh, and, uh, and exert pressure on the trade union leaderships. You know, even some of the better trade union leaders you know, particularly if they do not have the confidence to take on the bosses, take on the capitalist class, and to draw the necessary political conclusions um, that, that we need a new party 
of the working class, then then they inevitably will stump for the for the, for the safe option, and and the Labour Party is seen as you know the kind of lesser evil, as you know an organisation that they can at least sit around a table with uh, and, and and work with, um, and that leads to them you know making various you know deals and zigzags, um, and and ultimately you know calling for a vote. Um, you know, in lots of cases for the Labour Party, funneling money into the Labour Party. I think that, you know, that tension and that pressure will, will, will grow, you know, as we see the emergence of new political um, ideas and formations. So, for example, we're only, you know, we're literally, you know, you know weeks into a, uh, you know, a, a new Labour government. And only last week, when the first major vote and the first major rebellion against this Labour government occurred over the two-child um, benefit cap, Starmer moved to suspend the seven Labour MPs, suspend the whip of the seven Labour MPs who had voted against the government on this uh, question and effectively had voted in order to end you know, a policy that that's plunged tens of thousands of, of working-class people into poverty. And on that day... Actually, two of the MPs who were suspended um, by the Labour Party, you know, I, I shared a um, you know I shared a platform with them just outside Parliament on Parliament Square when our union was launching uh, its campaign for universal free school meals for children across the country. So inevitably, while there might be elements of the trade union movement who will, you know, seek to try and you know, avoid conflict with the Labour Party. You know, this is a rapacious organisation that, you know, at the first turn, you know, on a question of child poverty is willing to take disciplinary action against seven MPs, you know, in order to crush the left, in order to marginalise the left, and again, to send a message um, to big business and to the capitalist class that they are not going to be, you know, infected with left-wing ideas, you know, then, then, Labour leaders, you know, trade union leaders will be will be forced to decide on which side they're on. And so, you know, a number of trade union leaders have written to Starmer. The demands are quite mild. The demands, um, you know, clearly don't go don't go far enough. But the, the, you know, the situation at the moment doesn't doesn't allow for a, you know, comfortable, um, you know, coexistence between, you know, the, you know, the working class and uh, and this Labour government. That doesn't mean that we won't see trade union leaders um, sell out. That we won't see trade union leaders um, point things in the new dire- in a different direction. But I think we will also see movements developing within um, within trade unions uh, and within you know the wider um, you know working class um, over over questions of privatisation, over questions of new cuts. Um, and, and other policies that are harming, you know, harming harming our living standards. You know, the situation itself will not allow for um, for that happy coexistence. And it's interesting that you're talking about this issue where the the new Labour Party, the Labour Party as it is today, which is not for labour but for the billionaire class, uh, is attacking the standards of living of families with children. And actually, right here in the U.S., as you must uh, have heard, the Biden administration was the one that was responsible for ending the expansion of the child tax credit, which had been done actually under the Trump regime, not because Trump is on the side of working people, obviously not, but because his administration at that time during the pandemic was forced to expand that because uh, there was so much anger in society at the Uh, complete misery that tens of millions of Americans had been plunged in because of the economic crisis at that time and the pandemic itself. Uh, and that, but then Biden became the guy who uh, withdrew the expansion and then immediately plunged millions of p- families with children into poverty who had actually been lifted out from poverty when the child tax credit has been ex- had been expanded. And then despite all that, what we've seen is this spectacle in this, you know, within hours of Harris, who is now Biden's successor as a Democratic nominee or, you know, presumptive nominee, Uh, within hours of her declaring her campaign, you had the leaders of all the big unions in the U.S., most of the, them anyway, and also the head of the AFL-CIO, Liz Schuller, coming out 
and cheerleading the Harris candidacy, saying immediately that they're endorsing her, despite all the selling out of workers. And so I think that also connects to you know, the history of the labor movement, both in the United States and in the UK because, and in Europe, because it holds such rich and crucial lessons for how we should be building independent of the big business parties and also the role of socialists. And as you mentioned, Marxists, I mean, you, you are a Marxist, James, I am also a Marxist. Can you talk about how the National Health Service or the NHS was one in the UK? And, and I think this question is really also potent specifically in the United States because we don't have any kind of uh, healthcare of the kind that Canada has or Western Europe has. And it is a hugely popular demand. In fact, any candidate who would run on Medicare for All, as the demand is known most popularly here, would have tens of millions of people supporting them. Bernie Sanders ran on a platform that included Medicare for All. Of course, we saw the Democratic establishment completely obliterating his campaign from inside the Democratic Party. But all of this begs the question, you know, how do you, how, how did, uh, the working class in the UK win the NHS and what was the role specifically of the strike action and of socialists and Marxists in winning it? Obviously, let's be clear, that was won at a time when the Labour Party was a different kind of Labour Party. So the National Health Service in, in Britain was introduced in 1948, um, really out of the rubble of the, of the Second World War. And it was obviously also at a time when there was a bipolar world in the sense of the existence of the Soviet Union, um, but also um, a strengthened U.S. capitalism coming out of uh, World World War II, um, and you know the National Health Service in many ways was a reform that was designed to head off you know more far-reaching revolutionary uh, uh, movements. You know that. That there was a the seat. It was seen that there was a necessity to intervene. You know, you had troops, working class troops, coming back from the front, exhausted after years of um, you know of conflict. You had women workers who um, had maybe for the first time worked in um, in in heavy industry and worked in larger workplaces outside. Um, of you know kind of domestic labor um, and there was you know from sections of the capitalist class as well um, as the leadership of the labor party there was it was it was seen as something that was necessary to um, you know to, to head off something that could have been more far-reaching um, you know the conservative party was also seen as totally out of touch um, and not able to you know to tap into a kind of mood for um, for, for change, but ever since the inception of the um, NHS, which was you know opposed by the Conservatives uh, then, and you know in many ways is still opposed now, then it has been a constant battle um, to try to maintain it. And you know we've seen um, huge cuts to the National Health Service that have taken place. You know particularly in the kind of era of austerity. Brought by, uh, brought um, uh, brought in by the Conservatives, um, but also um, you know rampant privatisation that was particularly intensified by uh, previous Labour governments, and and that's something again that is continued, um, and that is a you know major threat um, to um, to workers, um, not just in the health service but more generally because because of the reliance on the NHS that you know Wed Streeting, the new health secretary someone very much from the right wing of the Labour Party. You know, he's made it very, very clear for you know months and months before the general election, before he was even uh, in office, that you know, he saw the need for the private sector to play um, a, an important role in reducing uh, waiting lists. Uh, obviously, the choice of um, Jeremy Corbyn's opponent was, um, you know, was, was, was quite significant and deliberate as well. You know that that the you know universal there is still universal healthcare uh, in Britain, but the quality of that healthcare after years and years of cuts um, has massively reduced. Um, you know more and more services 
are overstretched. More and more people are being pushed to pay for uh, treatment. And, you know, all of this, you know, really puts under, under threat the kind of long-term viability of the National Health Service if we don't fight for it. Um, you know, streeting has also engaged uh, Lord Darcy, who has um, a record in a previous Labour government of coming in and of um, bringing in reforms, more privatisation, more um, kind of you know marketisation and fragmentation of the health service, particularly here in London. Um, and he has been engaged again as, as the person to look at NHS reform. So we can be absolutely sure that under this Labour Party, the NHS is not in safe hands. Um, that yes, on, on, on the face of it, it's very difficult for any political party, including the Tories, to come out um, strongly against universal free healthcare, but it doesn't mean that, that the, the NHS can't be attacked um, from the back door with little cuts, little privatisations, um, and ultimately, you know, that can that can have a major impact on on people's, um, you know, perception of the of the health service and, and the need to fight for it because, um, you know, like any public service, and we feel this very much in education, um, you know, a big part of um, you know, of attacks and privatizations of of public services, you know, there is a stage that comes before where the that that public service is denigrated, it's run down in the media, you know, the horror stories and the sense of kind of crisis uh, emerges, and um, you know, it's kind of served up as a fait accompli that the only way that you're going to be able to resolve that uh, is by privatizing uh, that service by making it. Um, something that people have to pay for, even if it's you know only um, only in part. Um, so that's that's going to be a major battleground over the next few years. Is is you know it's fighting not only um, to try and um, you know kind of win back and reclaim some of the things that we've lost within National Health Service, but to stop um, you know continued privatisation and continued attacks uh, on 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 that institution, which is still held. You know, in, in extremely high regard, and obviously is still, you know, the biggest employer uh, in the country, um, and um, you know, something that's kind of seen as, you, uh, you know, kind of a real bedrock um, of communities. Yes, actually, that last point that you made is so familiar to American working class people because that's exactly what's happened to the public school system, and not not to say that it was ever funded in the full way that it needs to in order to actually provide quality education for all children everywhere in the US. However, what also has happened over the decades is the continual and systematic defunding of public schools, the public school system. And then, as you said, you know, making it a self-fulfilling prophecy where it puts working class people in a situation where they are given such terrible facilities and, and their children are suffering, their families are suffering with the, with the lack of real, um, you know, good quality school and education, where it sort of puts, this, um, puts them in this uh, right wing kind of thinking where it's like, well, public schools don't work anyway. We need charter schools or, you know, private schools, which, is, uh, which has seen a real rise in the U.S. And... Uh, I think you explained really well how even though it's really hard for them to do a full frontal attack on the NHS and still maintain their credibility, what they do is chip away, chip away over time at the reforms or progressive reforms that have been won. And I think all of this really uh, puts a highlight on why we need, as you said before, James, the need for revolutionary struggle because at the end of the day, even when we do win reforms, though those reforms will be hard won. But when, even when we do, do win them, they are never safe. They're always under threat. And then whenever the ruling class and their political representatives can get away with it, they will get away with it. In fact, right now, as we speak, I'm sure some of our viewers have already heard the historic $15 an hour minimum wage that we won in Seattle after I was first elected. We won this in 2014 through our socialist and rank and file labor led 15 now movement that is now under attack and it's an all democrat Seattle city council that is attacking it but again it's no surprise this is what they do this is why we cannot stop at winning progressive reforms as hard as it will be to win them we need revolutionary movements i really appreciate you joining us today and on strike james and 
I wish you and all your fellow uh, labor movement members, and especially in the NEU, good luck with all your work, and I hope you will join us again soon. Thanks, Sharma. Thanks, James. If you liked this episode, make sure to hit the like button on this video. If you've been watching On Strike, you'll know that we provide an analysis from the point of view of working class people about the problems we face in our daily lives under capitalism. In every episode, On Strike also presents a strategy for working class movements to fight back and win. That's why we need your support for On Strike. Subscribe to our On Strike channel on YouTube and become a member of Workers Strike Back to help ensure we can continue to organize to rebuild a fighting labor movement. By becoming a Worker Strike Back member, you can also help this broadcast. We don't run any ads, we don't accept any corporate money, and we rely entirely on donations from working people. Go to workerstrikeback.org and click on Become a Member. Solidarity.